here with us this morning. The book of Psalms says, Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. And that's why we're here this morning. We're going to shout to the Lord with gladness this morning. We're going to sing his praises. And it's going to be a great day to be in God's house. I thank you for all who are here this morning. If you're watching online, we appreciate that. Uh, we're going we're gonna to continue our live feed next week. Brandon Dunning is going to be speaking for us next week. He starts work tomorrow. And we are going to have a brand new camera set up. It's, it's working now, but it's just not ready to, to broadcast live. And next week, you're going to be amazed at, at the picture quality that we have. And better than that, I believe, the sound quality. See, I'm telling you, I come in here on Sunday mornings and I listen to these worship team, huh? And they do such a great job, and man, I just want to worship so much. And then I hear it on, online, and I think, yeah, it's just not the same. I want it to be better, and so we're going to have it better next week. And I'm excited about that, because uh, they deserve it. Now, I'm just going to tell you, the preaching's not going to sound any better. All right? It's the same old stuff, right? But, uh, but the music's going to be awesome, and I'm excited about that. So, we're glad you're here. Let's continue on with our worship service. God, we love you and thank you. You're a good God. And uh, we're here this morning to shout your praises. We thank you most of all for your son, Jesus. And so this morning as we worship you, we lift up your son, the one who died for us on the cross. And we shout for joy in his name. Amen. Amen.
freedoms that we enjoy. Uh, the Patriots, back during the American Revolution, laid down their lives so that the birth of this great nation could come about. And for some 244 years, I believe, ever since that time, American heroes have been doing the same to protect our freedoms that we enjoy all across this globe whenever our freedoms are threatened. Likewise, our spiritual freedoms also are not free. And you think, well, what, what is our spiritual freedom? And I can tell you we are set free from the bondage of sin, our own sin, because of also an almost unfathomable sacrifice. And that being the life of the perfect Lamb of God, our Savior, Jesus Christ, God's one and only Son, who was the only perfect candidate who could have done such a thing. In God's infinite wisdom and mercy, devised a plan for you and I to remain whole with him. And you, we talk about experiencing these spiritual freedoms I can assure you this morning. Brother J.D. is experiencing that freedom. So when we come around this table this morning, think about these things. Think about the freedom that we have as Christians, knowing that we do live in the greatest nation on this earth, and no, it's not perfect. We try to make it a little better as we go. But when we leave this earth, there is a perfect place waiting on us. And it was because our Lord and Savior shed his blood for you and for I on that cross. Bow your heads, would you please? Father in heaven, indeed, we're so thankful for this day. We're thankful, Father, for the for freedoms that we enjoy. And though we know they were horribly expensive, that we just can't appreciate enough of what's been done for our, our, on our behalf. Lord, we ask that as we come around this table, we embrace the, the thought that our Lord and Savior died for endured unbearable cruelty and pain and suffering so that we could have the freedom from that bondage of sin, so that we could have that place of perfectness to look forward to. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' most precious, most holy name. Amen. If you would, please, uh, if you would go to the stations and in the uh, corner of the sanctuary and, and take the meeting.
that um, we're going to honor next week. And, and as I said earlier, it's uh, probably not as, as big and grand as we want it to be, but um, it's time for us to, to do that. And so um, hopefully you'll be able to watch. We, um, uh, we're we going to have a uh, drive by, uh, I think it said a parade. That's a great word. I wish I'd have thought of that. Uh, next week, shower, a shower parade for uh, Spencer Sandy and Kylie Sandy. Spencer and Kylie Sandy, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, it, it's going to be back here at our drive through after church. Just get your car, drive through. They'll be standing there. You can give them a, a shower gift. I think that's an awesome idea. And, uh, and we're excited about that. Um, next Sunday, Brandon Dunning is going to be speaking for us. Brandon starts work tomorrow. We're going to throw him right into to preaching for you because he is an awesome preacher. And he's you're going to be uh, really excited to hear him. We're going to have a lot better feed for you next week, a lot clearer, a lot better audio, and um, and so um, I'm excited about that a lot. We're not going to start our treehouse next week. We're going to push that back a couple of weeks, but um, we'll be doing that real soon for you um, parents that are ready for us to get your kids back into youth worship, and we're excited about doing that. Um, we just need a couple more weeks to get some things lined up there. So. A lot going on here um, as far as as much as we can going on. And so um, just continue to, to keep up with what we're doing online. We'll be, uh, we will be live again Wednesday night from uh, somewhere on our property. We never know because um, it's kind of funny. Uh, I can get us all set up on the back deck if one of our neighbors decide to mow. And I can get us all set up on, on the front porch and the traffic's terrible out there. I'm telling you, it's something you wouldn't believe the traffic on Bono Hill. You also wouldn't believe the amount of fireworks. I'm telling you what, hope you had a fun and exciting July 4th and, um, and, and just really focused on the freedoms we do have here in America. And, um, and I hope that you shot off millions of dollars worth of fireworks like the people around me did. So uh, it was fun. We, um, uh, they were still shooting them last night when I finally got to sleep, but uh, it was good, and, um, and that's fun stuff. We're in a series called Another Brick in the Wall, and we're going to wrap it up today. Brandon's going to speak next week. He's just going to do a, a, a standalone sermon, and then we'll start another sermon series in two weeks that we're going to talk about um, uh, uh, talking to other people about Jesus. And so um, something the church needs right now for sure. Not just our church, but the church needs revival. And the only way that's going to happen is for us to go out and be the church and tell other people about this excitement that we have in Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this series has been talking about Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah, uh, his work and what he did for God. And, and we've kind of been building a wall here of bricks because Nehemiah rebuilt the wall of Jerusalem. And so each week we built a new wall, a new part of our wall, a new layer. One, two, three, four, five, six. This is our seventh week. And um, and I suppose I've had a lot of people say, man, I can't believe you actually have had a visual illustration that has not gone bad, okay? There's still time. We're going to build some more wall today. And, uh, and, and it's solid. I've tried it. I've, I've checked it out. But this is not the first project I've checked out that, that could go horribly wrong for me. Uh, we know all about pledges. We know what a pledge is. A, a contract, a vow, a promise. How good are we at keeping them? Uh, that's a good question. How good we, are we at keeping our promises? Our pledges. When it comes to marriage vows, statistics say that, that we're not real good sometimes at keeping those vows. We uh, we, we know uh, a breach of contract. That's a, a figure of our speech. We know what it means to, to not be able to uphold something. We sign our name to the bottom line. This weekend really makes me focus on a pledge that I learned when I was in school. In elementary school, every morning, we, uh, we stood up and we put our, we had a little flag sticking off the wall and we put our hands over our hearts and we pledged allegiance to the flag of what? The United States of America, right? And we do that thing uh, uh, by heart. I was going to tell you guys, it is hard, uh, it's not hard for me to celebrate freedoms because I think we got a lot of freedoms. I think sometimes we are, our freedoms are, are, are maybe stifled a little bit, squelched, and, um, and, and as, as, as 
Christians, we, as long as it doesn't go against what uh, we feel the Word of God says, we're, we're supposed to follow our government leaders. And so uh, we just kind of learn to deal a little bit with some of the things that come along that maybe are uncomfortable to us. And, and, and we just learn that we, we're still free, a country. But there's a part of the, the, the Pledge of Allegiance that bothers me a lot anymore. You see, we used to sing that part, really say that part really loud, where it says, one nation under God, indivisible, right? <laughs> right? Indivisible. That's what we said. Are we still a nation under God? Uh, I mean, you know, uh, would our forefathers be proud of us right now for, for some of the things they see going on in our country? I can't stand up here this morning and and just sing praises about us being in one nation under God when I'm troubled a little bit about some of the things that I see going on in our world. And so today, I'm not going to preach about that. I'm going to preach about Nehemiah, but some of these, when I look through this sermon that I wrote about the, the, the building of this wall and, and Nehemiah's closing comments to these people, he kind of got on them a little bit, okay? In his closing remarks, we're in Nehemiah 13, the last chapter of this book this week, and he's going to just wrap up what he's got to say. And I think he's got a, a, a few points here to make to them that really can walk hand in hand with us on a, a weekend when we are celebrating our freedoms. Now, as Terry said earlier, as much as, as it pains me sometimes to see what uh, the, the, the freedoms that we have and, and enjoy and how they're different than they used to be, we should certainly on a weekend like this celebrate those who have given their lives to our, for our freedom, who have given their time for our freedom, and have been there brave enough to fight for our freedom. And so none of that we're taken away from. But I want you to walk with me through chapter 13 in the book of Nehemiah. And, and what I want you to see here is that Nehemiah is talking to a bunch of backsliders. All right? He, he, went, he finished his job. 52 days they built this wall. Miles of wall. They cleaned up the mess. They put the wall back together. But Nehemiah stayed in Jerusalem for several years. If you remember way back early, when he wanted permission from the king to go to Jerusalem, the king, one of the things he asked him was, how long are you going to be gone? Nehemiah didn't really know, and, and so he just told him, I'll be back. I promise you that. He gave him his word, and he returned. He left. He did his job. He left. He went back to the king. He said, here I am. I'm ready to go back to work. And he did. But after just a while, the king said, you know what? You've done your job. And you did a good job, Nehemiah. I appreciate you, buddy. But it's time for you to retire and go back to your homeland. So Nehemiah did. He was excited. He headed back for, uh, for his home, and he was rejoicing in the fact that he was going to get back to Jerusalem. But when he got back, what he found was the people had built the wall, but they had also settled into a real dangerous situation of apathy and complacency. They had gotten comfortable with who they were and where they were. Now, Nehemiah loved his city, and he loved his country, and I do too, but he didn't like it in the shape it was in. So today, I just want to look and see what he has to say about, uh, about his people and his city and his country and what they should do. The one thing I want you to remember today is this. Here's one thing. We know the difference between right and wrong. Okay? We, we know the difference between right and wrong. We learned that at an early age. It's time for the church to be the example of what is right. Okay? When it comes to, to our freedoms, when it comes to being one nation under God, when it comes to, to knowing what the scripture says and actually obeying it, it is time for us, the church, and it is time for you to be the church and to set an example. In Nehemiah chapter 13, he sets the people straight. He sets the people straight on some things. I'm going to look at them today and we're going to use some bricks to make our points. First one is this. They said yes to sin in the temple. Nehemiah didn't like that, I promise. So we're going to put a brick down here. And our first brick is going to be, we've got to get sin out of the church. Okay? And I, we, we 
we've had a sermon series about this last fall. We cannot let the devil get his foot in the church, all right? And, and that's something that doesn't happen overnight. Uh, this is complicated, and it doesn't really, it's, I think the, the way sin gets in the church is kind of like a flat tire. Every now and then, maybe once in your lifetime, you're going to be driving down the road, you're going to hear this loud pop, the steering wheel's going to jerk, and you're going to say, wow, I blew out a tire. But all the other times that you have a flat tire, how does it happen? It's kind of gradual, right? One day it has air, you come out the next morning, oh no, my, my tire's flat. You, you, you might uh, go to work and everything's good. You come out that afternoon and your tire's flat. How did it happen? It happened gradually. And that's how we as a nation go from one nation under God to, to not knowing right now exactly where we stand. So what happened here when we opened up this chapter? The word of God was being read again in the temple. And, uh, and, and what we read here, I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but what I'm just going to paraphrase and tell you what's going on here is the Old Testament law forbid the Ammonites and the Moabites from being in the temple. Uh, and God had his reasons, okay? They, 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 uh, they, they really complicated things up for the people of Israel. They even hired a, a, a seer by the name of Balaam to, to come in and, and curse the people of Israel. And so God said, okay, y'all did your thing here. You're happy about it, but you're not allowed in my temple anymore. When, uh, and, and so when Nehemiah got back, what he found was is that the high priest of the temple had decided, well, that's an old law. Okay? And we've got to change with the times. We've got to be politically correct. We don't want to offend anybody here. And, you know, I know some Ammonites and I know some Moabites and they're not all bad. And so I'm going to just turn my head and we're going to let them back in the temple. Nehemiah chapter 13 verse 3 says, When the people heard this law, they excluded from all Israel who were being a foreign descent. That's, that's the law right there. He says they can't even come in to our nation. Instead, the high priest decided to let them into the temple. Not only are they in there in the city where they're not supposed to be, he lets them into the temple. And here's what made it worse. If you've been with us through this series, you might remember that, that uh, Nehemiah had some opposition to his building. You remember those guys? Sand ballot? One of my favorite names in the whole Bible, I don't know why. Sam Ballot and his buddy Tobiah. Now, what Nehemiah found when he got back was is that the high priest had actually taken an empty room that says it was a large room that used to store grain. He says, we're not using this room anymore. Tobiah, I tell you what, you don't have anywhere to live. You can live in the temple. How do you think Nehemiah liked that idea, huh? He came back, his arch enemy was living in the temple and he wasn't supposed to be there to start with. Well, let me just tell you, and you can read through it, it's awesome to read, Nehemiah cleaned house, okay? Huh? I'm telling you what, he didn't like it a bit. He wanted to get, Tobiah represented sin to him. Here was sin in the temple. He says, you guys let it in. And I'm going to do something about it. Now then, uh, we've got to keep sin out of the church. Now, I'm just going to get real with you here. That if, if, if you're bringing sin in with you, you need to check it at the door. Because God and sin don't mix. And so, and so we all come in here sinners saved by grace. Don't, kill, don't get me wrong there. I know that none of us are perfect, and this church is not perfect, but don't bring your sin in with you. Leave it in the parking lot. God is in the ends of business. Jesus Christ died for your sin, so don't come in here and act like nothing's wrong and leave with your sin. You leave it at the door. Because I'm going to tell you what, the, the New Testament kind of changed the rules here. Let me explain what I mean. First Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You are, were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. And so if he tells us, get sin out of the temple, and our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, what are we supposed to do here? Huh? 
He's not just talking about the church building. He's talking about you too. Get rid of the sin. And so our first brick here is, is a, a brick of sin. And we're, we're using it to build our wall because we're getting rid of it out of our heart. We're getting rid of it out of our church. We need to get rid of sin in our church. We need to get rid of sin in our home. We need to get rid, rid of sin in, in our city, in our communities. And we need to get rid of sin in our body. Now then, at the, at, through the, this chapter of the book of Nehemiah, there's four prayers. Each time that he throws something out there to him, he wraps it up with a little prayer. And in verse 14, he says, he prays, remember me for this, my God, and do not blot out what I have so faithfully done for the house of my God and its services. He says, God, I know I just, just made a, 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 a big mess here, and I, I might have embarrassed me, but forgive me if I did what was wrong, because I'm trying to do, do what's right here in your temple. Uh, second brick. Let, let's talk about another brick here. We're going we're gonna to put it here in our wall. They were too busy to keep the Sabbath holy. Huh? That's a pretty good looking. I've got to get centered. We're getting on up here a little bit. If I don't, if I don't get this right, I'm afraid I'm going to have an accident. I'll never live it down. They were too busy to keep the Sabbath holy, and so their next brick here is the Sabbath. Now, uh, I know this is, uh, uh, if you've read up on the scripture, you're going to say, well, they observe Saturday as the Sabbath. It's the last day of the week, and we did in the New Testament that the, the first day of the week is called the Lord's Day and so we uh, celebrate God and we come to his uh, worship service on Sunday and so Sunday is our day of rest uh, physically and day of rest spiritually and and so there's nothing wrong if, if you maybe know a church that's uh, struggling with more services than they can do on Sunday they have a Saturday night service don't don't knock them on that because you know that's uh, for, for thousands of years that's been the holy day we do it on Sunday because the scripture tells us to meet together on the first day of the week. All right? So we need a day of rest. The Bible tells us that from the beginning. God created the world and he rested. He, he gave Old Testament laws that told people, you're going to rest one day a week. You're going to rest one day, one year out of so many. You're going to rest. And, and, and he has all these complicated laws about getting rest. Why? Because rest is important. And we don't just need physical rest. We need spiritual rest. Rest, not from taking a break from being spiritual, but resting ourselves, our bodies, and our minds so that we can soak in God. And so we need this, this brick of the Sabbath. Old Testament law was very, very detailed and complicated on what was uh, permissible on the Sabbath. And not only that, but, uh, but, but then there was the, 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 the spoken Word. Yeah, they took the written law and they, they even took and made it even more complicated. So these people really had struggled with what they could and could not do on the Sabbath. By the time Nehemiah got to town, they just basically did anything they wanted to. Okay, there was no holy day. There was no day of rest. They would come into the temple occasionally, especially the godly people. But for the most part, it was just business as usual on Sunday. I mean, excuse me, on Saturday. Our first day, their last day of the week. It says in uh, verse 17... I rebuked the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this wicked thing you are doing, desecrating the Sabbath day? Didn't your ancestors do the same thing? So that our God brought all this calamity on us and on this city. Now you are stirring up more wrath against Israel by desecrating the Sabbath. See, what he saw when he got into town is the wife presses were working, the donkeys were working, everything was working, everybody was working, they were picking uh, grapes, and they were making wine, and they were doing everything they did all, all week. They were not taking time to remember God, and he didn't like it. And so he, uh, once again, when he, he really uh, opened up on them, and he let them have it. He, he had the gates locked to the city on the Sabbath. He, uh, he went outside the gates and he said, hey, if you're out here and you're trying to get in, if you're, if you're even thinking about climbing over this wall we built on the Sabbath, you will be physically threatened. Nehemiah didn't take any prisoners, okay? He, did, he, did. he was not intimidated by anybody. Where do we stand?
stand as a nation when it comes to the Sabbath? Is it different than every other day? I hope, I hope for you it is. I hope that you plan your week, and I hope you plan your weekend around uh, coming to God's house on the Sabbath. I hope that, that, that this is a high priority in your life. And guys, I'm going to tell you, as, as, a, as a leader in your home, I think this is one of the most important important examples that you can set, set for your family is to be a spiritual leader, to say, hey, this, this is important for us as a family to, to, to get up and get dressed and go to church and sing songs and, and, uh, and, and pray and take communion and, and uh, do all the things we do because this is our time away from the world. It's our time for us to be a family. It's our time for us to grow together and bond together. Where do we stand? And, and I'm just going to tell you, I know that um, it's a holiday weekend, and so I'm excited to see you guys here. I know I'm excited that people are watching us today. I know it's a holiday weekend, but what about the other 51? Okay? Uh, yeah, it's easy to get out this weekend and travel and set some time apart. And doing family things is awesome, okay? When Brandon gets in here and gets settled in, I promise I'm going to take a, a vacation week. It's been a while. can't do that all the time. You see, sometimes I think we have gotten so comfortable, and that's what Nehemiah was upset with. We've gotten so comfortable as a nation that we take some freedoms for granted. The church in Iraq is the fastest growing church in the world. And, and it is a, a, a thing that they cannot do in public. They sneak around. They uh, they, they meet in, in basements. They meet in small apartments. They meet in, in small little buildings, they meet in the back of businesses, they meet anywhere they can, they can't carry their Bible with them, all they can do is just show up and act like they're doing something else and then they have church. The church in China has grown for years doing the same thing, underground church, secret church, try not to get caught church. The church in Haiti, when we were in Haiti, I enjoyed uh, going out to these churches that we support and seeing these crude block buildings with no air conditioning, the only thing they had to sit on was um, was wooden benches or maybe an old folding chair that was wobbly and nobody wanted it anymore and they come out somehow confiscated it. And and Juby told us that, that these churches, which would just be in the middle of nowhere, maybe a village, but those villages just had a few homes. He said they will be 300 people in this little building every Sunday, no matter the weather. They have uh, rain, they walk, and they, they have to cross rivers, they, in the floods they walk and if it's hot they walk and they want to come to church because they want to hear about Jesus. Nehemiah said, hey folks, I'm going to tell you something. Y'all are taking this for granted and it's time to refocus on this brick called the Sabbath. He prayed in, in verse 29. Verse 22, I'm wrong. I knew that wasn't right. Verse 22, he says, Remember me for this also, my God, and show mercy to me according to your great love. He lined them out on the Sabbath, keeping it holy. And then he prayed to God, forgive him if he did wrong. What about our next brick? They let idolatry rule their hearts. And so we're going we're gonna to take this brick, and we're going to make the, the brick here in our wall of idolatry. Something... We can build our wall with it, but we've got to get it out of our hearts, okay? And, and it might be okay for, for building this wall, but um, you know what? I see what you guys see here, and Mitch is not doing a good job. I need a, I need a mason up here. Uh, I'm about to, my, my, my wall is starting to go this way. Uh, idolatry is our next brick. Now, be careful reading this, okay? And, I, and I can't, I'm not going to read this to you. Uh, it, it's several verses here. I want you to go back and read starting verse 23, but this is very, we've got to be very careful to read this. And this is something our nation's dealing with right now, and it's not pretty, but I'm just going to tell you, this is biblical. And sometimes people like to take what's in the Bible, and they like to stretch it and turn it and use it for their own good, and when they do that, that they're going to be judged for it. All right? So if somebody tells you what they read in the Scripture, you know it's wrong, Call them out on it. You see what happened here is Nehemiah said, I don't like it that you people are, are, are marrying foreign women. And I don't like it that you're letting your, your 
daughters go marry foreign men. And, and part of the problem here is these people had dark skin. And, and, and we're just gonna, I'm just going to throw it out there. But that was not what Nehemiah was talking about. Same situation back in the Old Testament. Moses married a, an Ethiopian woman. And his sister didn't like it. She said, why did you marry that dark-skinned woman? And so God struck her down with leprosy. Her skin all of a sudden was whiter than she wanted it to be. And, and, and God struck her down and said, don't judge her because of her skin. And in the same way here, Nehemiah throws down on these people. He says, don't marry the, 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 the women from Ashdod, Ammon, and, and Moab. But it had nothing to do with their looks. The problem was they worshipped pagan gods. Okay? And that, and, and that did not go over very well with Nehemiah. I'm just telling you, he didn't like it at all. He said, look, there's plenty of good women around here. You don't have to go over there and marry these women who worship pagan gods. And you don't have to let your daughters go over there. I know they want to, but, but get them a guy who worships the same God you do. Intermarrying with these pagans just watered down their walk with God. practice of idolatry is, is allowing something to get between you and God. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm going to throw this out there. That's something that I've had to deal with plenty of times in my life. Man, I find something that I think is good. It might be a, a way to make extra money. It might be a new hobby. It might be a having fun with the family. And all of a sudden, these things that, that are in and of themselves good can come between me and my walk with God. And anything that comes between me and my walk with God is not good and is evil. And that's what the Bible tells us. Nehemiah said, look what happened to Solomon. If you remember the story of Solomon, David's son, Solomon was a great king. Solomon built the, the temple. Solomon did unbelievable things. But Solomon had one weakness, women. All right? He had between his wives the women he had officially married and those who he, his concubines who he had pledged with, he had a thousand women. Think about that. Make, I mean, make your own jokes. I, it's a, there's, there's way out there plenty of them. And if y'all watch on Wednesday night, you know jokes are my, not my strong point. So you know, it's, uh, it's okay. Make your own jokes. But what, what Nehemiah said was Solomon had it all going until he focused on the women. And then he lost his focus on God. And all of a sudden, what was good turned out to be an idol. He worshipped the flesh. And we cannot do that. There, there's so many idols out there. They, they come in so many different forms. We've talked about them before. We've talked about them. We'll talk about them again. Idols, they're not a gold statue that you put up on your mantle and your mantle and you bow down to idols can come in many different ways Nehemiah prayed in verse 29 remember me remember them my God now I'll stop here you remember the first two prayers he said remember me and this one he says remember them my God because they defiled the priestly office and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites as a country, we have got to take our eyes off idols. And I think this is one of our greatest dangers right now. We take things that we enjoy. We take things that we love. We take things that we take people that, that come between us and God. And we have got to be one nation under God. And we've got to focus on the one who gave his son for our sins. Last brief in our wall here is this. Nehemiah decided it was time to confront sin. I, I'm going to put a few more bricks here in the wall in just a little bit, but uh, as far as our, our, our uh, points from Nehemiah today, uh, that's, that's a pretty good looking wall, huh? I'm proud of myself on this one. If y'all need any wall building done, um, I will. I, I, unfortunately, I can't do that on Sunday morning, okay? Because I don't want to let this come between me and God, but... Uh, I'd make a good price on some wall building.
guys, and, and we always had this one rule. It doesn't matter where it is from, from the first tee shot to the last putt. You get one mulligan. You get one do-over. You can use it any time. In 18 holes, all the shots, you've got one shot. You can hit it in the water. You can dump it in the grass. You can miss a short putt. You get one do-over.
and I will forgive their sin, and I will what? What's it say? I will heal their land. And I don't know about you folks, but I'm ready for God to start healing a little bit. I'm just telling you, I'm a little bit tired of what's going on in our world right now. I haven't watched the news in weeks because it depresses me so bad that it just puts me in a, in a, in a dull mood that, that I know I'm cranky to be around. Nehemiah said, get rid of the sin. And then he prayed this. Remember me, verse uh, 31. Remember me with favor, my God. Man, Nehemiah just came in, cleaned house, told the people this is how it's going to be. He poured out his heart, and then he said, God, I'm trying to do my best for you. Treat me kindly, sir. And that's where we are, as a, I think, as a church. It's time for us to get down on our knees and pray. God, heal our land. God, help us to see what's right and wrong. Help us to be the church. Help us to be the example out in the community that you want us to be. We can change this city. We can change this country. We can change the world because we are the church and we are, have overcome every threat from the gates of hell that have ever been thrown at the church. And we can do it again. And so this morning, for our takeaway, I'm going to give you five things that we can learn, not just from today, but from the book of Nehemiah, okay? And we'll just put bricks up here because I'm going to press my luck a little bit, all right? First one is this. Don't be afraid to be doing something big for God. That's a brick, okay? God has got these huge plans for you. He says, I know the plans I have for you. They are big, big plans for you to do something good. And so many times we shrink God down and say, God, I don't know if I can do that. But I'll do the little job for you. God wants you to do something big. He sent Nehemiah to rebuild miles of a rubble wall. And they did it in 52 days. Second thing is this. Don't be afraid of distractions and opposition that might try to derail your plans. Okay? You remember Sanballat? You remember Tobias? These guys, they, they were, every time that Nehemiah tried to do what's right, they, they undermined it says they built the wall with one hand because they had a sword in the other hand. He had security guards. He had guys with trumpets. He says, we're going we're gonna to do this. And one of my favorite verses in all the scripture, verse uh, chapter 6, verse 3 of the book of Nehemiah says, but he was so busy and they were distracted him. Come on out to the plains of Ono for a little vacation. You need it, brother. And you remember what he said? He said, I'm doing a great work. I cannot come down. That's got to be one of our bricks. Next brick is this. Seek to resolve relational problems that cause division. There you go. That's a big brick in the church. That's a big brick in your neighborhood. That's a big brick in your home. That's a big brick in your uh, uh, community. Whatever it is, we're going to. They had internal issues that nearly derailed his plans. Okay? We got rid of all this uh, outside interference. And all of a sudden, people started grumbling. We can't do that. As a church, we can't do that. As a nation, we can't do that. We've got to be one nation under God. Amen? Last, uh, next, last trick here, okay? Don't play around with sin. You know what happens when you play around with sin? You get burned. Romans 12, 9 says, hate what is evil, clean what is good, okay? We're going to hate what's bad. Get rid of it. We don't like it. We're going to stomp it. But we're going to hold on. We're going to embrace what's good. I really miss uh, uh, handshakes and hugs here at church. I really do. And virtual hugs stink. That's, that's a waste of time. Sometimes you just want to embrace something, don't you? Embrace. Find what's good. Put your arms around it and run with it. Last brick is this. Our last takeaway is cultivate a lifestyle of praise and prayer. Ooh. There we go. Just for fun. Yeah, look at that. I work cheap. Cultivate a lifestyle of praise and prayer individually and publicly. Don't be afraid to pray. I, I won't say any names. I, I was talking last night to some friends.
this text message, and they were telling me that they saw their son uh, with his eyes closed and thought, what's he doing here? And they realized he was praying. He was in a public place. Teenage son. I'll tell you something. We can learn from those. It don't, doesn't matter how old. We can learn from anybody that's not afraid to say, God, I feel a little weak right now. I feel a little intimidated right now. But you know what? I'm just going to hand this over to you, and you're going to take care of it. You're going to make me safe. You're going to give me strength. You're going to help me when I feel weak. And there's plenty of times during your week you're going to need to pray. You're going to need to lift up God. Nehemiah was not afraid to pray. He wasn't afraid to praise God. He wasn't afraid, afraid to pray to God. We can learn a lot of lessons from this uh, from this story. And I'm telling you, you can. Learn, I love walking through the book of Nehemiah. This has been fun. And uh, I'm just going to tell you, I have, I have enjoyed taking it just week by week and learning some of the, the obstacles he went through. We've learned that Nehemiah just kept his eyes focused. Whatever the job had to, to, he had to do, he kept focused on it. And no matter the opposition, he kept focused on it. And that's our job. See, we are citizens. And we're not just citizens of a great nation, the greatest nation in the world. We are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We need to do what's right. This morning, I'd like to ask you to stand with me. Um, if it's time to reboot, this is your time. If you're watching us online.